Across their breeding, wintering, and year-round ranges, dark-eyed juncos inhabit nearly all of the U.S. and Canada, making them one of the continent's most common and abundant songbirds. But depending on where you've seen them, your concept of what a dark-eyed junco looks like will vary from place to place. For example, the juncos studied at Mountain Lake, Virginia, are part of a uniformly gray, slate-colored group that breed across Alaska, Canada, and the mountains of New England and Appalachia. But farther west, other groups of dark-eyed juncos appear strikingly different. The northwest corner of the state of Wyoming is home to some of the most iconic scenery and impressive wildlife in America, attracting millions of tourists every year. The Grand Teton's rugged mountains are one popular destination, rivaled only by the geysers and geothermal attractions found at Yellowstone National Park. A certain group of dark-eyed juncos also makes an annual visit to this region. But they're not here to see Old Faithful. Instead, they come to breed in the lush mountain forests during the spring and summer months, taking advantage of the mild temperatures and abundance of insects. Named for the colored feathers on their flanks, these pink-sided juncos also have brown on their backs and wings, features that clearly distinguish them from the slate-colored juncos. The breeding range of pink-sided juncos is restricted to high elevation forests in the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming and Montana, a smaller range when compared to their slate-colored counterparts. Moving farther west, another group known as the Oregon juncos can be found breeding in forest and woodland habitats ranging from British Columbia to Southern California. On average, Oregon juncos are smaller in size, their brown backs are similar to pink-sided juncos, yet their dark hoods could make them pass for an entirely different species. In the mountains of Eastern California, Nevada, and Utah, juncos take on yet another distinct look. Here, their heads and bodies are a muted gray, giving them the name gray-headed juncos. But perhaps a more distinguishing feature is the bright red patch of feathers on their upper back. Throughout North America, juncos typically breed in forest and woodland habitats, which are found at either high latitudes or high elevations. These environments can look as different from one another as the birds themselves, but all of them have common features that juncos require. Trees, shade, grass, and ground cover for nesting and foraging. Among the most extreme climates inhabited by dark-eyed juncos is the Black Hills of South Dakota, home to the white-winged junco. The rugged open landscape is dotted by ponderosa pines. Brutally cold winters turn into scorching summers. The dry conditions make the area susceptible to wildfires, and juncos are among the first animals to move back into recently burned habitats. This makes them a useful indicator species for wildlife managers. White-winged juncos are the largest of all the juncos, and they also have the most white in their tail feathers. They get their name from the white bars on their wings, a feature that is thought to be a social ornament. Ornamental feather colors such as white tails, dark hoods, bright backs, and colored sides are used to attract mates and establish social dominance. These traits distinguish the different dark-eyed junco groups, raising the question, why are birds that look so different classified as a single species? At the Natural History Museum in San Diego, California, Curator Phil Unit oversees a research collection containing nearly 50,000 birds. Highlights of the collection include exotic parrots and giant eagles, but still the ordinary, extraordinary junco is among Phil's favorites. The junco is especially interesting to me 
because perhaps more than any other bird of North America, it has uh, really conspicuous uh, variation that still seems to be within one species. The complexity of the junco can be subtle, but it can be obvious as well. And so you have a whole spectrum of uh, variation from the gross to the subtles. You know, gross difference between an Oregon junco from the Pacific Northwest and a gray-headed junco. Uh, you know, no one ever would think those are the same species. In examining the specimens by hand, researchers can collect detailed measurements of color, shape, and size, and make comparisons among different groups. Museum collections exist today due to the tireless efforts of field ornithologists, men and women like Alden Miller, a professor at Berkeley, who in the 1930s set out on a decade-long quest to catalog and classify all the juncos across North America. Miller wanted to understand the process of diversification. He spent months at a time in the field, capturing juncos, mapping their locations, and taking detailed measurements of color, shape, and size. Examining an astounding 11,774 junco specimens in the process. In the end, he identified 21 distinct groups of juncos across the continent. 15 of these groups inhabited the U.S. and Canada and had the common trait of dark brown eyes. These dark-eyed juncos could be lumped into six distinct groups that looked quite different from one another, and each group had its own breeding range. But Miller made a curious observation. In the zones where the different juncos' ranges met, it seemed that they could easily interbreed. For example, where the gray-headed junco and the Oregon junco's ranges meet in the mountains of Nevada, it's not uncommon to observe the two subspecies producing offspring together. Here, an Oregon junco mother tidies up and removes a nestling fecal sac. Moments later, the gray-headed father arrives with food. The hybrid offspring of mixed junco pairs are fertile and have traits blended from both parents. Their ability to interbreed in nature is the primary reason dark-eyed juncos are currently classified as a single species. But this left Miller puzzled. Why could groups that looked so different interbreed so freely? He hypothesized that they were all closely related. But limited by the tools of his era, Miller had no way to further explore their evolutionary history. Today, Dr. Borja Mila from Madrid's National Museum of Natural Sciences has taken up Miller's quest. This has puzzled ornithologists for over a century. You know, how can two juncos that look so different in terms of plumage type, uh, how can they interbreed so, so easily when they come into contact? Of course, uh, Miller, what he had was things like uh, patterns of plumage color, or eye color, or bill color, and how those change across space. Now we have uh, this very powerful tool, which is uh, the DNA, and within DNA, we have like a footprint of the evolutionary history of the group. Genetic work has become a, a, a ver an indispensable tool in the study of evolutionary relationships and the, the study of speciation in general we can actually compare different populations or different species in terms of the divergence uh, in, the in the DNA sequence of a certain gene of interest. Using DNA from blood or feathers, researchers sequence specific gene fragments from multiple populations or species. The sequences are aligned and the mutations that differ can be compared. So two populations can be identical genetically or they can differ by several mutations and quantifying that amount of divergence is very useful to then reconstruct a phylogenetic tree, like, uh, uh, like a genealogical tree that allows us to understand the evolutionary history of the group. In this example, populations B, C, and D share a mutation in the third base pair that distinguishes them from population A suggesting that these groups likely share a common ancestor that diverged from population A in the past. Also, 
Populations C and D share a mutation in the eighth base pair that distinguishes them from population B, indicating that C and D are the most closely related and share a recent common ancestor. Population D also has a unique mutation that distinguishes it from population C. Because all four genetic sequences are quite similar, they likely share a common ancestor farther back in time. Once we have put together these evolutionary relationships between the different uh, species or populations, we can actually understand better how these different physical characteristics, like plumage color or eye color, changes with time. Another very, very useful tool to us uh, is what we call molecular clocks because we know that some parts of the genome mutate at a constant rate. We can calibrate that rate, and then for a given level of divergence, we know that it's equivalent to a certain amount of years. Mila and his team used a mitochondrial DNA fragment called cytochrome oxidase 1 that typically distinguishes even closely related species of birds. Based on known divergence times from other species, the molecular clock of this gene has been estimated to tick at a rate of approximately 2% sequence divergence every 1 million years. But for the dark-eyed juncos, the genetic sequences were so similar that it was impossible to construct a typical evolutionary tree. Instead, the six major groups clustered together, more like a bush, all differentiated from a common ancestor, the yellow-eyed junco which inhabits the highlands of Mexico and Central America. Between dark eyed junco forms, we find very few genetic differences. And that means different lineages, even though they look very different in terms of plumage, they're extremely young. So they diverged very, very recently, just a few thousand years ago. In fact, we know this happened after the last glacial maximum, which took place about 20,000 years ago. So this, uh, in evolutionary terms, is uh, extremely recent. So this helps us to understand this, this capacity for interbreeding, which was very difficult to understand otherwise. And genetic data allows us to obtain a date for when that divergence happened. Combining Alden Miller's data on geography and physical characteristics with Borja Mila's genetic results, finally allows for a comprehensive explanation of dark-eyed junco diversification. I think what's unique about the junco radiation is that uh, it's two things. It's that it's very rapid, but also that it's very recent. That about, you know, perhaps 10 to 20,000 years ago, this yellow-eyed junco from the highlands of Mexico expanded northward and recolonized North America as the, as the glaciers receded right after the last glacial maximum. And as these populations recolonized North America, the, the changed eye color from yellow to dark, also the bill changed from bicolor to a pink colored bill. And then we have, as populations came isolated in different parts of North America, they also developed, they evolved different plumage types giving rise to the different dark-eyed juncos that we see today, including the slate color, the gray head of the pink-sided organs, etc. It might be surprising to learn that the common dark-eyed junco represents one of the most stunning examples of rapid diversification in the entire animal kingdom. But there would be even more surprises to come as researchers set out to examine other junco forms found south of the border. <laughs>